Dr. Klein is talking about opioid dependence and personal responsibility. Gotta love it. You know, we, you we, yeah, we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. You right. Know, there's always some type of epidemic, some type of crisis, something for the politicians to go screaming after. And now that we're ending up uh, close to midterms, it's going to get louder and louder. Yeah, yeah, we do have a bunch of people that are overdosing on medications. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, but it's no different now than the drug crisis back in the 1970s. You know, we had Nixon go after them. We've had every president since, you know, declare a war on drugs. It sounds an awful lot like the war in Afghanistan. You know, it just keeps going mm -hmm. and going and going. What they need to do is declare victory and move on to something else. Well, what is it about opioids that's so darn, uh, you know, let's say addictive? Okay, is it the only drug that we have out there that is addictive? Is it the, is it the worst of the bunch? Well, the fact of the matter is it isn't even as bad as, as high fructose corn syrup in terms of addictive uh, qualities. Corn syrup is more addictive than cocaine. So it takes a great deal, actually, to become addicted to these compounds. It takes a, a predisposition, which is a doctor way of saying that you have a weakness, an illness. You have, there's something wrong with the, an individual to become addicted to these things to begin with. It takes a fairly interesting physician or medical complex to promote it, but that's really not where the deaths are coming from. So we have to dissect the problem. Is it medical use of the medications that's, that's the biggest issue? Is it the tacit agreement on the government's part to look the other way while these things are being done? Or is it illegal drugs causing the deaths? Well, right now, the big deal is fentanyl. You know, when they went after oxycodone, which they should have done years and years and years ago with regards to its availability and misuse, it dried up. So now what are they going after? Something cheaper called fentanyl. Now, fentanyl is one of the most potent uh, opiates out there, and they're mixing it with heroin. Wouldn't you know it? When you've when you got a needle in your arm and you're getting ready to squeeze it, you don't know that this stuff might be two or three hundred times more potent than the stuff that you used earlier this morning. And then wouldn't you know it, the addicts wind up dead. The problem isn't the epidemic of the opioids. The problem is an epidemic of mental illness and addiction. If we dealt with the problem as it is, we wouldn't have much of a problem whatsoever. So what do you, how, do you, you know, how do you control it? Well, you can only control what you can control. You can only influence that which is able to be influenced. So what we can do and what we should do is this. Looking at opioid prescription. In our country and in this state as well, okay, it doesn't take a special DEA license for any physician, anybody licensed to write a class 2 narcotic. These are the most potent of all. Class 2 narcotics are the most potent of the bunch. So you can come out of internship. You don't even necessarily need an internship necessarily to get a, a medical license in this state. But as soon as you get that license and you pay your 50 bucks or $100, whatever it happens to be to get your DEA license, you too can become part of the problem. So what do they do? They allow any physician with a license, pretty much, to write these prescriptions. Unless you've had a disciplinary action, you're one of the problem. Now, does this mean that you have to have special training? The answer is absolutely not. Does it mean you have to have any training? The answer is absolutely not. Okay. Whoa. Yet these individuals can write these prescriptions in whatever amounts and whatever combinations they see fit. Therein lies the problem. This is compounded, okay, by the fact that you don't even have to be a doctor in the state of Florida to own a medical practice. Now, I want you to think that one through for just a second. If you're a dentist, you can own a dental practice, but if you're a lawyer, you can't own a dental practice. If you're a lawyer, you can own a legal practice, but you can't own a surveyor's practice. But anybody can own a medical practice in the state of Florida. So you end up with some miscreants, sometimes organized crime and so on and so forth, hiring these individuals to write these prescriptions, and then when they get busted, and they frequently do, they can't shut down the office because the office didn't cause the infraction. So they simply bring in another one of these mis uh, miscreant doctors, and it's business as usual. That's fairly unique to the state of Florida. Hmm. Congratulations. We're going to lead it again in this one. So more so, okay, oddly enough, is that, any, again, any physician can write these prescriptions. So as a surgeon, I started off as a surgeon, you can write these prescriptions for weeks and weeks and months and months without really understanding what you're doing with regards to opiates. And they're not all the same. They are no more the same than antibiotics are the same or antidepressants are the same or, in, in, in effect, muscle relaxants. They're all different. 
Opiates are different. They hit different receptors in different ways. They have different pharmacodynamics, and they have different addictive potentials. But one of the things that you know about acute pain is it goes away. Okay, it is not typical for somebody having surgery to need medications of this nature longer than about 10 days, really three days for most surgeries. You have a cesarean section, you're going to hurt for a couple of days after that muscles cramp, okay, but no opiate is going to take it away. If you break a bone, you're, you're going to hurt for a day. If you do knee surgery, you might have two or three days that you have pain. Why is it that dentists are allowed to write weeks and months worth of prescriptions for things like having wisdom teeth removed? It's a little wonder okay, that these will supply you know, the drug abuse chain. When that dries up, there'll just be more fentanyl coming in from Mexico, unfortunately. So we have to look to the sources. Why aren't we building that darn wall, doing something to keep people from walking the darn bricks of these medications over the border? Why aren't we doing something to keep them from coming in by the truckload? And the argument's going to be, well, then they'll fly them in? Easier still. We can control things that are flown in or, or, or uh, taken in by boat a whole lot easier than we can if they're walked in over a thousand mile border. It's craziness what we're allowing this country to do. We're causing our own uh, pain and agony and we're blaming everybody but the people that are responsible for this. Which gets down to really who is responsible. And the answer is the person doing it for God's sake. It is not necessarily anybody else's fault but the person that has the needle stuck in their arm. Now, I don't know about you, and I don't know about uh, the, you know, the rest of the folks that are listening in, but when I went through school, we were pretty well taught that doing intravenous heroin wasn't such a great idea. It wasn't something that a sensible person would do. You didn't have to go to school to realize that wasn't such a great idea. Try to give a kid a flu shot. See how much fun it is. They don't like having needles stuck in their arm. Yet somewhere along the line, we've fallen down in our parenting skills. We didn't do the right things for our kids to teach them right from wrong. So we can blame the addict. I think we take one step further back looking at the dominoes, and the real issue may well be the parents. Whether the parents are at fault for not teaching their kids about morality, about teaching them right from wrong, good sense from bad sense, okay? Whether we're teaching our kids you know, about the value of life, whether we're teaching our kids about uh, any number of other um, you know, ethereal and somewhat philosophical concerns. But the drug abuse problem that we're having didn't start in the doctor's office. I've been doing pain uh, amelioration work for 37 years, okay? I've been on top of this for that length of time, having this discussion with some fairly well-known uh, public officials. And it comes down to figuring out what it's going to do to identify the problem and deal with it directly. And what is it going to be? taking personal responsibility instead of going out there and blaming a bunch of people that are blameless. Look at the parents, the grieving parents. Yeah, they deserve the blame. But are we going to sugarcoat it for them also? No, it's, it's, the, it's the way things go. Now, you're going to have uh, kids that aren't going to listen. You're going to have duds, as it were. You are going to have problems. Mental illness is what it is. But there's plenty of blame outside of the medical community. You know, you're going to go out there and sue the manufacturers? You have got to be kidding me. Why not sue the car manufacturers for the drunk drivers? It makes about as much sense. Why not, why not uh, you know, sue the bus companies for the people that, that uh, shoot up the bus uh, station or whatever it, it happens to be? You're not going to go suing the teachers because of this, uh, the shootings at the schools. The problem is one of personal responsibility, and we have gotten far afield in this country for many years now about taking personal responsibility for our actions, our inactions, and the actions of the people around us. If you see a problem, you report it. If you've got a kid that's an IV drug abuser or an oral drug abuser, you report the kid. You get them into treatment. Not doing so is going to end up with a dead child, more than one dead child, or a dead motorist because this is a big problem and it's now becoming everybody's problem. If we sugarcoat this thing, it's going to end badly for all of us. There's a lot of people in the general populace that has never heard of fentanyl. Um, what does it do? Fentanyl is a very, very potent uh, opiate. It's like morphine except 100 times more potent. Wow. So you're looking at microgram doses that are equivalent to uh, milligram doses of morphine. So you take 100 milligrams of morphine intravenously. That's a good healthy slug for, for an opiate addict. But you go ahead and you take 200 micrograms or 300 micrograms of fentanyl, you will stop breathing. That is the way it goes, and it looks the same. 
Oddly enough, it doesn't look that different to the, to the untrained eye. And if you don't know what's in it, you're already half stoned from your previous fix, guess what? You're going to end up uh, being found dead with a needle in your arm. And this happens with some regularity, increasing regularity of late. Wow. If you want to know more about the doctor and his practice, SufferNoMore.com. That's SufferNoMore.com. And I want you to look into StagesOfLifeVitamins.com. What a good program for you. StagesOfLifeVitamins.com. We'll see the doctor again tomorrow. See the.